Welcome to another Founder Wisdom Pod. We have Gunita Singh Bala with us today. She's a visual artist turned physicist turned founder of the 1947 Partition Archive, which is her company. We're going to talk about nature, empathy, history, compassion, and oral history today. This pod is brought to you by podpower.com. If you want to start scale, be invited to podcast and monetize the unconventional way, you can go to podpower.com. Gunita, welcome to the pod. Tell me a bit more about yourself and about what you're up to nowadays. Yeah, so as you mentioned, I am um, I was formerly a physicist uh, at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. I'm sitting in Berkeley right now, but I eventually got compelled to document oral histories of an event that's mostly been left out of our global history books, but was pretty impactful and still is to the whole world. Um, so that is what I do. It's We document the partition, it's the creation of India and Pakistan, which is essentially, um, you can think of it as the South Asian chapter of World War II, the South Asia theater of World War II. So it was after that, uh, the fall of the British Empire. And, you know, what's happening right now in Israel and Palestine is very much connected to the same time period and the fall of the British Empire. Um, so we've been recording oral histories from that time to kind of understand it better and to give it its place in history and to kind of ignite that critical analysis of what happened in that time. Why did you turn to what you're doing nowadays? It seems like a hard pivot, physicist to uh, documenting history. Yeah, well, you know, my family was one of the refugee families from that time period. And um, it seemed like um, history because it was not understood, because there was not enough data, it was so manipulated, it was being written by whoever was in power. So Pakistan has a totally different story. India has a totally different story. The British have a totally different story, right? So how do you reconcile these? And the truth is that none of their stories are really complete. And there's a whole other story that the ordinary people lived, millions of them, that hadn't been told. And so the idea was that, um, and it's part of my identity, it's part of who I am, I'm, a, I'm an immigrant in the US, I came here as a child, and for me to understand where I came from, who I am, and what world events shaped me, and the fact that they were left out completely of our textbooks in the US, and it was such a massive global event. I'm curious. Um, nowadays, I read Wikipedia when going to bed. I find that the uh, shorthand article are more interesting than books, more impartial than books also, because books are from authors and publishing houses with their own point of views. Wiki is still not um, the golden ticket, it seems. There's editors in there and they have their own views. So where should I look for impartial information and short form inter information, or am I looking at the right spot with Wikipedia? You know, you are so right. Um, so yes, Wikipedia does have, uh, it has biases because it does have editors. It does have uh, people. I've seen a lot of bullying on there because I have gone in and worked on articles myself and I've seen how certain editors will think certain things need to be on there. So there is a little bit of that going on there as well. But yes, you do see the most up-to-date information there. So I think it is a pretty awesome and comprehensive source if you're willing to dig deeper beyond Wikipedia. You have to take it with a grain of salt, but it's a great starting place. Um, but yeah, I agree. Um, that's actually the point of our work. What we're finding is that history is actually, it's not only very nuanced, um, but history changes depending on who you ask because everybody's interpreting it through their own lens, through their own experience. One person's hero could be another person's terrorist. Do you know what I mean? And you see that throughout history on every side. And, um, and I think it's really important to start to see history from the ground up because there's, you know, there's like the academics who have the skills to write about it and they write about it and we hear their perspective. But what about all the millions of farmers, the you know, people doing other jobs where they did not perfect that skill of writing, but they have so much history, they have so much to tell, and their version of history is totally different. And that's what has been left out for thousands of years. Um, and so I think now with the modern tools that we have, you know, it gives us a chance to kind of hear all sides and humanize everybody. Suddenly the terrorist might be a person too, right? 
you're a human too. Maybe we need to start listening to each other. And I'm hoping, my hope is that by doing oral history, we can learn to humanize each other and we can learn to understand the fact that everyone's going to have different perspectives and that we need to move beyond these, you know, multi-generational, I'm a victim kind of history storylines, historic storylines that so many communities have been telling themselves. And those are finding themselves in modern conflicts, right? We're seeing that happen right now. And so I feel like humanizing all sides and listening to all these different perspectives can really kind of help you grow in that direction. We're seeing that with the Hamas-Israel conflict. I'm just not <clears throat> sure what to say at that point. You know, um, well, the simplest in me would just like to think or or believe that, you know, people some people will want to fight pretty much forever and it's quite hard to extinguish extinguish a fire a fire that's constantly burning uh, on a daily basis people just add gasoline on that fire it's like hate stories after hate stories he killed my dad he killed my cousin and oh uh, they've been raped and there's mis misinformation left and right people think with their emotions it seems rather than facts and i'm not sure how to stop that ever because that's where human nature uh, well, at least bottom of society, because I think top of society, a lot of people have, have learned to control their emotions. So uh, what what to do here? I mean, on my side, I can speak as a white guy living in Mexico with an odd background for sure. But it's like my own story, my own beliefs in, in that, you know, like I work with a bunch of Israeli startups on my side. So I'm biased, you know, and I have my own experiences with the Arab world. So it's like, okay, I have my own bias. So I'm not going to tell people what to think as well. Uh, so is that like a defeatist mindset of mine? Is it too simplistic? Uh, how could we think better or document history better to spread out information in a more streamlined and, and clean way to people so that conflict could potentially stop? There were 10 questions in there. Yeah, that's a lot of questions and I have so many answers and um, things to discuss. I think some of those things, some of those things that you asked, we don't have answers for yet. We need to figure those things out um, because I think I kind of almost feel like we need to drop, airdrop like an army of mental health workers. Everybody is so traumatized in that conflict. We can't expect them to stop. Yeah, they're going to keep going after it because that's human nature. I think um, here, something that Yuval Harari, the famous historian, you know, who wrote Sapiens, I watched an interview with him because I think some of his, his family members were abducted on uh, October 7th. Um, and he's a very thoughtful person who's able to see a lot of different sides. Um, and he said something that's, I think, really important. He said, we're not capable of stopping the violence because we are too closely involved. We're hurt. We're too emotional. He said the rest of the world needs to step in and help us out. So I think that therein lay our answer. Like they're telling us what they need. They need the rest of us to come in and be like, hey guys, stop this. But here's the dilemma where my tax dollars in the US, you know, and I pay, paid a lot in taxes. Uh, my tax dollars are being used to give weapons to one side of this conflict. And personally, on a personal level, I have team members who are Palestinian right now who are hurting a lot, whose family is in danger. I have family in Israel. So, um, you know, I think I have sort of personal connections to both sides. Um, but I, I do, I mean, despite that, when I look at the situation from the people that I know and from what I'm seeing, just, you know, as a person on the outside, I'm like, wow, we are giving a lot of weapons to one side here. We're helping uh, one side technologically a lot. And instead, um, I think we need to step in and stop this madness. But I also understand that there are other forces that we don't see, financial forces and things that we just absolutely do not know because they're outside of the public eye. They're also shaping this war. You know, I don't know what who funded Biden and what, kind of money they gave him or what's going on. Maybe there's some stuff going on on the level of the um, agencies, of the spy agencies that we, we just don't know, like the full story, I feel like. Uh, but on a more humane and human, humane and human level, um, I feel like what Harari has said has a lot of wisdom in it, is that the rest of us need to step in and there's a lot of trauma. It's gonna, we need mental health workers. You need to listen to both sides. You need oral history and the rest of us need to step in 
without taking sides, but being like, whoa, hold on, guys. It's human nature to um, be vindictive. And right now they're just both being vindictive towards each other. Um, and that can't, if that, you know, yeah, that could keep going on forever or the rest of us can step in. That's what it sounds like is needed. But what that looks like, I don't know. That's really complicated, right? I don't know what that looks like. I like Yuval's book, but I think he's a drama queen seeking attention to get more uh, book sales. Um, that's my take on him since I've watched <laughs> his AI stuff, you know, like end of the world AI. I also think he's, yeah. Is he still in Israel? Uh, because I've I think questioned... he is. Okay, interesting. Because um, I found it's quite like a different perspective for folks that actually live there. I think Yuval has the choice to move, you know, like yes. he's like yeah. flexible and so forth. Um, I'm not discrediting his opinion, but like the rest of the world needs to intervene seems sort of naive. Um, the world has tried to intervene and it's always been common wisdom to not intervene in these types of things like shit can blow from all over the place pretty quickly if we check history you know second world war yeah. and first world war as well with nato and and all of that and yet yeah, also outsiders they just don't understand the reality i mean even if you visit tel aviv for one day or jerusalem you won't really get a taste of truly what it means um to be there you know when I think your people have been massacred Uh, by a side that you've been trying to help and yes it's so easy to be angry at someone else and want to pay back but to me it seems that yeah I would trust way more uh, Israel than Palestine with weapons it, and uh, I think most of the world would that doesn't mean that what they're doing is okay but I mean it's so hard for the rest of the world to speak when you know these people have got a bunch of folks massacred and beheaded in one day it's like a terror attack on them it's I think one comparison could potentially be like 9-11 when uh, terrorists crashed um, airplanes and, you know, towers in the U.S. And all of a sudden, I think it was like, what, 80% of people that were in favor for invasion? Um, and Yeah, invasion I was happened. one of those people who was not in favor of invasion. And I saw, I was there in New York. I mean, in fact, I was on top of the towers before, you know, just a few days before <laughs> they collapsed. Um, because I feel like Um, this is where you have a moment to be like, wait, why did that happen? What are we doing in the Middle East that caused that to happen? And if you look, you know, America did a lot of shit in the Middle East. We did a lot of terrible things. And it was mostly because of oil and our oil business. Um, so I think those guys responded in a certain way. And it was, to me, it was a wake up call. I mean, if you saw Charlie Wilson's war, you see inklings of what happened there in that movie, right? We, um, the uh, Afghans helped us uh, defeat the Russians. Uh, we promised to build roads and schools and bridges. And instead, what did we do? We just left them in poverty and disappeared and never did our part of the bargain, right? And so they were more than happy to harbor Uh, bin Laden, who's who's Saudi, who's not even from there. Um, so I don't know, these types of things I think are, uh, for me, that's like a wake up call. It was like, oh, do we want more bloodshed now in response to that? Like what happened? Um, also, our president at the time used it as an excuse to invade Iraq. Iraq was completely not connected to the conflict. You know, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq had nothing to do with Uh, the Taliban and um, Afghanistan. So I feel like when you are this, you know, behemoth, this huge superpower, um, it's your responsibility to kind of uh, be like, whoa, wait a second, I have the power to destroy these people. But why did they do this to me? You know, it's like a parent. Like if your kid comes and like hits you in anger and you're thinking like, wait, Uh, oh, I can go smack my kid. But the other option is you'd be like, hold on, why did this happen? What did I do to you to make you respond this way? That would have been my, um, and I was very young at that time, but I still remember very vividly feeling that way. And with, um, you know, the Israel-Palestine conflict, it's very hard to, for me to give it that same level of attention, well, you know, depth of understanding, because I'm not in either place, like you said. Here, I was in the US, so I knew what people were thinking. I know like um, here, it was also the way George Bush presented the argument. 
it's all about how the people in power present the argument. And he did a really good job. So people were very much in favor of invading anyone. They didn't care. They just were very angry. So they wanted to retaliate, you know. And Iraq was obviously um, just became an excuse. Um, they had nothing to do with any of it. So that was a personal vendetta thing for um, George Bush. But so, yeah, that's my yeah, take. His, his dad has had history in Iraq in the oil fields as well. Um, yeah. It's not necessarily conspiracy theories, but it's just basic stuff and, you know, collateral. Like, we're going to get there. And worst case, we're going to finance our own war with that, you know. Um, yeah. There's a lot of warmongering uh, and war racketeering as well in the U.S. And yes, you need to be really careful with that. But the analogy would be more like you at the park and, you know, there's a guy that comes and stabs your kid to death. And then you have your other kids and your family, you know, and he's like, what do you do? Like me, I just neutralized the threats. Um, it's hard to think because we still have these, this primal brain of ours and we're... We do. Th these biochemistry in us, adrenaline and all of that, cortisol, they stay for a while, you know, and they're constantly reinforced by new pieces of information. So, and Bush is like, oh, do I want to risk being the worst president in history with that thing that is pretty much unprecedented, you know, like two, two planes crashing my tower. So what options do I have? I mean, it was an easy decision for him yeah. for the U S as well. Um, Increased his popularity because he didn't win by a popular vote. If you remember Al right. Gore actually won the popular vote and all that stuff was going on. Right. Um, Actually, I was referring to Afghanistan uh, invasion, thinking about it. But anyway, they're they're sort of in the same bucket. Um, I think, you know, also we could not predict what would have happened if we wouldn't have uh, invaded uh, Iraq and Afghanistan as, as NATO. So it's always super hard to judge if a decision was good or not. But it seems we're still operating on golden rules as a society. It's like, if you do this to me, I'm going to do that to you. There to is protect, some wisdom yeah. in there, but um, I think we need to be a bit more progressive, you know, and me as a technologist, I, I tend to think like, oh, we have all this data that we can get. Can we have AI step into that? Can we have more intelligence in Israel, like spy on people? Yeah, people will complain about their privacy, but at least we're going to know if they, they plan to like behead a bunch of people. Uh, can we prevent that possibly? Everything comes at a price. So what do you think of integrating technology to capture more data and make better uh, decisions during these conflicts? I think, yeah, I think even before, we may need to step back on that one a little bit because the Israel-Palestine conflict, and if you go to the question of why this October 7th event happened, we're not looking at what happened in 1948. A lot of these people who are living in Gaza were actually put there after removing them from their homes, right? There's a lot of bitterness about that. That part has not been resolved and Israel is continuously expanding into their territory. Um, so I think using technology uh, to spy on, or you know, to increase security Israel is already doing that a lot in Palestine. I mean, to a point where I know in the U.S. that could never fly, what they're doing over there. Here, people are very, um, they're very picky about privacy. Uh, people do not want to be spied on. If you notice, you know, China has these cameras everywhere. In fact, they're planting them in every single village right now. Um, that cannot happen in the U.S. People here are so attached to their this concept of privacy, they will not allow that to happen here. Um, and so I think it is happening in other parts of the world. And as an American, of course, I lean towards more privacy. But yes, in this case, it is um, a sticky situation. But I think if they were to actually come to a solution um, that was non-combative, they wouldn't need to employ these means. They wouldn't need to use breach people's privacy and use AI. Um, if they could simply come to an agreement about, hey, this is the boundary. You guys stay on this side. It's a two-state solution. So I tend to think as an outsider that that to me seems like the most feasible. And this is me coming, oops, sorry, my phone almost dropped. Okay, this is me coming from a conflict zone 
myself. Like I was raised right on the border of India and Pakistan, right? And th that area is always igniting into a war. And plus the region that I came from, the reason we even came to the US is they had a genocide. Did the Indian government try to kill like our ethnic group, right, in the North? And so, um, so just knowing that, I know that we would have wanted, so that's why I think Harari, what he said, whether, you know, we agree with, yeah, he probably is marketing for his books. You're probably right about that. Um, but despite that, I think that's probably why it stuck with me is because I know that we would have wanted that. We would have wanted the other uh, people in the world to step in and help um, stop the conflict. Because when conflict gets too out of control, it can be difficult for the people in the conflict to stop it. So that's what I think. Yeah, and the fog of war, you know, like when I I think it's not necessarily like intervening physically or maybe like, yeah, not directly intervening, maybe like some training and coming like at, as middlemen, but yeah, definitely not taking over everything because yeah, there can be value. It's like practice and, and theory, right? Both go hand in hand and people on the grounds they they have practice and people outside they have theory and they don't have the fog of war that yeah. cortisol you know blocking pretty much any information or uh, brain progress so right what do you think of the role of us uh, un in the un in that case uh, do you think they can help or are they pretty much useless like a bunch of people claim <laughs> Well, UN seems to not have the power. It hasn't been designed to have as much power as it needs to step in. I think the US is way more powerful than the UN, unfortunately. Um, and I think the US is making a choice. It has, it has made the choice to support Israel with weapons. Um, and that, you know, as someone living in the US, I find that very troublesome. Like if we were supporting Hamas, I would find that very troublesome. I just find it troublesome that we're supporting one side instead of trying to mediate. Yeah, indeed, viewed viewed that way. But at this point, it's like, yeah, diplomatic relations and solve strategy at this point. You know, it's not really caring for the people and what will happen to what side. It's more like, hey, can I buy you, you know? <laughs> can I buy your loyalty? I think that's what it yeah. is. And I was reflecting lately about, you know, the danger of, of that and just outsourcing so much of a country's foreign policy and relations and big decisions or micro decisions that have huge impact on a long term. You know, most people don't have a clue of like what the U.S. does out there with the diplomats and all of that. Um it seems that it's still ego operating, you know, it's it's yes. guys with like totally. their cognac and talking about like, oh, let's do this, like uh, the, the good old ways, you know. Uh, how can we change that? I think that has to change at a very fundamental level from when people are children, like education, because that's self-awareness, right? That's all about self-awareness and emotional development because ego and being able to recognize you have an ego and when it's playing, when it's getting in the way, I think that's all... Um, emotional development, emotional intelligence. And that, um, it needs to start at the school level. It's happening. I mean, you see that a lot now. You see a lot of schools, especially here in the Silicon Valley area. Um, children are being raised very differently. But the most of the world, I don't think is like that. I think it's a very, it's something that's happening in like the very wealthy parts of the world. Um, and I don't even know if it's fully happening, but I do see a lot of stuff in that direction happening. Tell me about the partition itself, because I'm not familiar at all with what happened there. Um, tell me the, the broad lines about what happened and um, the frustration, the challenges, and how things are nowadays. Yeah, so I think it all started um, in Burma in 1941. So Burma was bombed, I think, two days before or after Pearl Harbor in the US. At the time, Burma was part of British India, so it was part of Britain's Indian colonies. And um, when Burma was bombed, there was a massive exodus of British and Indian people who had settled there. But 
go back about 200 years and what the British had done in order to colonize, and this was their strategy, um, they had, they started giving away land and developed businesses to um, people in India who had been educated under their system and other British uh, individuals to move to Burma and develop it. So at the time, you know, it was Rangoon, now it's Yangon. Um, you had a lot of these people who owned businesses, lived there, they had settled, they were from India, they were not Burmese. Well, um, the Japanese collaborated with Burmese nationalist groups and they ousted everybody who had settled there, about half a million people from the British Empire. And these people ran on foot. So half a million people, a lot of them died. They walked to India through jungles um, and Britain lost Burma to Japan. And this was in 1942. So uh, what happened is the theme there was that um, the indigenous people wanted their land back and they took their land uh, and it was a very violent event where all of these settlers, some of them didn't even realize they were settlers. They'd been living there for a few hundred years, a couple hundred years at least, you know, their families um, had to leave if they were not Burmese um, in ethnicity. And then you see something similar happening in 1947 in India, the British, um, so 1945, the, um, I think uh, the Labour Party comes into power in Britain and they're like, oh, yeah, let's get out of India. Like Britain is, you know, devastated after World War II. We need to rebuild. We do not, we can't handle our colonies anymore. Um, and so with that uh, comes, you know, this idea like, okay, well, how are we going to leave it behind? So there's a lot of different factions. India had over 500 kings at the time. The 500 kings were like, well, we want our kingdoms back. Um, and then there were other factions, political groups that had formed, and they were like, well, no, we want like five countries or three countries. They split us up into, you know, all these different ways. So they ended up listening to this idea of creating two countries, India and Pakistan. And um, what that meant was that lines were going to be drawn through provinces, Bengal and Punjab. These are two provinces that they were going to draw the line. Um, and that also meant that, you know, when this line drawing started to happen, people started to realize, oh, well, the British are going to leave now. So all of these people that have settled in my village or in my land because of the British, I have an opportunity now to kick them out. So you start to see that in the region that is now, you know, bordering Afghanistan and Pakistan, the Northwest Frontier region at the time. Um, you'd start to see tribal people starting to attack non-tribals. And you start to see um, you start to see a lot of uprooting of people uh, who had been settled by the British maybe a few hundred years earlier or maybe a hundred years earlier. And so starts this huge migration. And this, so what would happen is, say, you know, a tribal group kicked out to Hindus in the Northwest Frontier region, they would migrate over to, cities that are more Hindu dominant in what is now India, people there would get angry after they heard their stories and they would start killing Muslims in their town. So there was this tit for tat based on religion. And it went so absolutely out of control that by the end of it, 1% um, of the world's population became homeless. So one in a hundred people or one eighth uh, of the world's population started sort of moving around in South Asia at the time. And it, um, and you know, millions of people died, millions of people lost their home. It was the biggest refugee crisis until the Ukrainian crisis. And it was all because, you know, the British could have managed the creation of these two countries, but you had a change of leadership in Britain. The new guys knew nothing about India. So they just kind of went in with like, ah, oh, there's a bunch of people We need to create these two countries. Let's just do it. They did some drawing on maps. It was completely theoretical. The old guys actually, you know, had been serving there for decades. No one consulted them. They knew how to do this. Um, so, so that democracy in the, you know, uh, democracy in the leading power, whichever power is colonizing, um, can also impact the colonized. You know, it's happened with Afghanistan and the U.S. Uh, when our, you know, that's where Charlie Wilson's war was all about. So. Um, it was all about the U.S. made certain promises. Then an election happened. 
And the new members of Congress came in and they're like, oh, no, 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 we don't want to uphold that promise. And then you get 9-11 after that. So, so um, yeah, so I think there's a lot of lessons there. But um, in India and Pakistan, it created a nuclear hot point that's still there today. It's the most second most militarized border after North and South Korea. It's very flammable, very volatile, um, and it's a danger for the whole world. Why is it volatile? Um, people are still pissed at each other because me, I mean, I worked with a bunch of Indians and Pakistanis and in my mind, it was like same people, um, very similar yeah. culture, very similar attitudes. I mean, there were modern folks, right? Young folks, but um, yeah, why, why so volatile? Um, there's a couple of things. So one, during election time, India often starts conflicts with Pakistan so the incumbent party can win. You know, it's like the George Bush thing again. Uh, that's one thing that happens. But secondly, they're fighting over the water resource. In Kashmir lay the biggest glaciers that feed all the rivers in India and Pakistan that basically provide water to like 2 million people. And China, they also provide water to the Yellow River. So India, China, and Pakistan are all sort of running after those glaciers. And so it's like a water war in a way. There's that element. So there's several elements, the water war thing, the um, political thing, then the ego thing. Interesting. Hmm. And that's why your opinion on uh, folks potentially intervening and not pulling out of uh, conflicts or, or yeah, conflicts before they actually erupt. Um, how does one document all of that? You documented a couple, couple thousands interviews. Um, yeah. How does one do that? And, how, and then how do you extract data and make sense and statistics? Or even is it even relevant to reason in terms of statistics in these cases? Yeah, well, um, how do we document? So we focus on people's experience, their lived experience. And uh, we actually work with people in the community. So we don't, like, I'm not going to go document someone from a different community. If I'm, if we're doing stories in Burma or, sorry, Myanmar, um, formerly Burma, we're going to work with, um, you know, people from that community to document stories in their own community. Um, so there is that element. And then in terms of how do you analyze these stories, well, that's where the historians and academics come in. So we operate as an archive, as an archive of data. And we do have a lot of historians and, and um, academics who come and look at this data and look at different themes and pull out different themes and kind of undo a lot of the um, sort of pop culture misunderstandings that have been generated by both countries. Like I said, both countries have their own narratives and Bangladesh has a completely different narrative um, it's a third country in all of this. And the fourth country, United Kingdom, has a different narrative. And um, our job is to kind of reserve everything. And then for the academics and historians to come in and look at, look through this data, because there are thousands of themes that come out and kind of really challenge the very divisive um, government-led narratives. such a beautiful piece of work like 10,000 memories in one book the memoir that um you're pre-launching right it's almost done yeah it's almost out right yeah how do you make sure some of these stories are not bs you know like how do you make sure they're truth um you have to cross check so I'll give you an example i had story of a gentleman who talked about um, when his village was under siege in 1947, because it was like complete lawlessness. Basically, the government collapsed, the British government collapsed, and looters just had a heyday. That's what happened, essentially. It was like a property grab. And um, his village was besieged, and he talked about how these three women came on horseback with, you know, they, they had ammo all over them, and they bombed the mobs. 